Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2015 Royal Terrell Museum Speaker Series. Today, the Royal Terrell Museum and its cooperating society are proud to present our very own Dr. Francois Terrien. Francois is the curator of dinosaur paleoecology here at the Royal Terrell Museum of Paleontology. He obtained his uh, undergraduate degree in geology at the University of Montreal. He then moved to the U.S. to pursue his master's degree in geoscience at the University of Rhode Island. For his thesis, Francois studied the paleosols of the late, Crita of the, uh, late Triassic uh, Chinle Formation in order to reconstruct the paleo environments in which the early theropods lived in the American Southwest. Subsequently, Francois moved to Baltimore to pursue his PhD in functional anatomy and evolution at John Hopkins University School of Medicine. For his dissertation, he studied the paleo environments of the late Cretaceous dinosaur bearing formations in Romania. Fresh from his PhD, he came to the Royal Trail Museum as an NSERC postdoctoral fellow and was later invited to join the research staff in 2006. Francois' primary research interests revolve around the study of dinosaur paleo environments and dinosaur behavior. Over the years, he has done fieldwork in Canada, the US, Romania, and Mongolia. Today, Francois will, will uh, discuss why fossils of dinosaurs are so abundant here in Alberta and showcase some of the important dinosaur discoveries made in Alberta over the last 140 years. So without further delay, I present you Dr. Francois Terrien. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I'd like to thank everyone for uh, coming here today. Um, anyone who has lived in Alberta for over a year will know that Alberta truly is the land of dinosaurs. There hardly goes a month without some dinosaur discovery making the headlines. And that's because there are very few places in the world where you find the same diversity and the sheer abundance of material that we find here in Alberta. So for example, we have at least 18 different species or kinds of horned dinosaurs. In fact, nowhere else on Earth do you find as many different types of horned dinosaurs as you do in Alberta. So Alberta should probably be called the land of ceratopsians. We also have at least 15 different species of duck-billed dinosaurs, some with large elaborate crests, some without, so a little bit of something for every taste. We have 10 different species of armored dinosaurs, some with large spikes sticking out of their sides, some with funky clubs at the end of their tails. We also have seven different species of dome-headed dinosaurs, dinosaurs with a thickened skull so they can headbutt one another just like bighorn sheep do today. We have 12 different species of odd bird-like dinosaurs from the ostrich mimic ornithomimids all the way to the cassowary-like canignathids. We have 19 different species of small meat-eating dinosaurs, some closely related to Velociraptor of Jurassic Park fame, others more closely related to birds. Unfortunately, most of those species are only known based on teeth because their bones are so small and fragile that they are usually destroyed before we discover them. And then finally, everybody's favorite, we have at least five different species of tyrannosaurs, ranging from local hero Albertosaurus all the way to superstar Tyrannosaurus rex. And if diversity is not your cup of tea, you're more interested in the sheer abundance of material of bones we find in the province, then you'll know that in some places, such as Dinosaur Provincial Park, there are so many bones in the ground that it's impossible to take a step without crushing dinosaur bones under your feet. So for all of those reasons, Alberta easily ranks in the top five best places in the world where someone can discover and study dinosaurs. But why do we find so many dinosaurs here in Alberta? That's a common question that keeps being asked here at the museum. And the answer is because Alberta has the perfect combination of two factors. We have the right geologic history, combine that with ideal climatic conditions, and together they lead to many fossil discoveries. So in terms of uh, geologic history, we need sedimentary rocks that formed when dinosaurs were alive. Any other type of rocks will not preserve dinosaurs. And then in terms of climate, we need a climate that will allow for bedrock to persist at the surface 
and for erosion to happen so new fossils are continually uh, brought back at the surface. So let's start by looking at the geologic history of Alberta. We said that we needed sedimentary rocks that formed when dinosaurs were alive. Well, when were dinosaurs alive uh, exactly? So if we look at a time scale of Earth's history, we see that dinosaurs lived during a time period called the Mesozoic Era. So the first dinosaurs appeared roughly 230 million years ago, and all non-bird dinosaurs went extinct 66 million years ago. So that time interval is often referred to as the age of dinosaurs. So now if we zoom in on the Mesozoic, we can see that it's subdivided into three periods that most people are familiar with in the room. We have the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous periods. And we can see here depicted in blue, I've shown what the range of the age of dinosaurs uh, is. So do we have rocks of Mesozoic age here in Alberta? Well, the answer is obviously yes, otherwise we wouldn't find dinosaurs. So here we see all the boxes represent the different rock packages that were deposited during the Mesozoic. So we have some rocks that formed at the very beginning of the Mesozoic, but before the age of dinosaurs, so before dinosaurs were alive. So it makes sense that those rocks will not contain any dinosaur fossils. Then after a long gap of nearly 100 million years, we have rocks that deposit around the, the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary. And these rocks, rocks preserve very few fossils. We have some dinosaur footprints from those rocks. But other, other than that, yeah, we know very little about the dinosaurs from that, type, that time period. Then we have rocks that formed around the middle part of the Cretaceous. And we have a few more fossils from those rocks. We have lots of footprints but we only have one dinosaur skeleton from rocks of that age. So again, we have a little bit more information, but still we don't know a whole lot about the dinosaurs from that time period. And then finally, we have rocks that formed at the very end of the Cretaceous, and these rocks are packed full of fossils. In fact, nearly all dinosaurs discovered in Alberta come from the last 15 million years of the age of the dinosaurs, or from the very end of the Cretaceous. So what was going on in Alberta at the end of the, of the Cretaceous to explain why we find so many fossils in these rocks? Well, if we look at what Alberta or North America looked like at the end of the Cretaceous, we can see that Alberta is ideally located between two major features. So on the east, we have a large inland sea that connected the Arctic Ocean all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. That inland sea is often called the Western Interior Seaway or the Bear Paw Sea. And then on the, west, on the west side, we had the rising Rocky Mountains that had started forming just 10 to 15 million years prior. So as the Rocky Mountains were rising, we have large rivers that are flowing east, transporting a lot of sediment being eroded in the mountains and transporting the sediment all the way to the inland sea. And rivers back then did what rivers do today. They would flood and bury the unfortunate plants and animals that happened to live on the floodplain. Now, floods would happen only once in a great while, but over millions and millions of years, they would end up burying millions of bones under soft sediment. And then with time, the soft sediment turned to stone and the bones turned to fossils. So Alberta has the perfect uh, geologic history to preserve dinosaur fossils. So if we combine that with Alberta's modern climate, which especially in the southern half of the province is a very dry, semi-arid climate that greatly limits the amount of vegetation. So this means that we don't have big, dense forests that cover the landscape. Instead, we have prairies. And the root systems, the root networks of prairies of grasses is much shallower and weaker than the root networks of, uh, of forests. So this means that erosion happens more readily. And especially along rivers and tributaries, we'll have a lot of erosion forming uh, the badlands so that Typical uh, landscape of uh, rugged topography, rounded hills, steep canyons, and very limited uh, vegetation. So in the badlands, we'll have maximum exposure of bedrock. And because the bedrock formed when dinosaurs were alive, we have great potential to find dinosaur bones. So where do we find dinosaur bones in the province? Well, if we look at a geologic map of the province, where all the different colors represent rocks of different age, and uh, I've uh, depicted in green the city of Calgary, in blue the city of Edmonton, and in the little red box is Drumheller. Then if we use what we know about the geologic history of the province, we can actually predict where we can find dinosaur bones in the province. 
So I mentioned earlier that in order to find dinosaur bones, you need sedimentary rocks that form when dinosaurs were alive. So if we remove from Alberta all of the rocks that formed either before or after the age of the dinosaurs, we see that still we have nearly three quarters of the province that consists of rocks that formed during the age of the dinosaurs, primarily during the Cretaceous. And you can see that both Edmonton and Drumheller are ideally located on rocks that formed during the age of the dinosaurs, but Calgary is built on top of rocks that formed after the age of the dinosaurs. So that's why you'll never hear in the news that a new dinosaur skeleton was discovered during road construction around uh, Calgary. And that's unfortunate, because the early settlers, when they decided to establish Calgary there, if they had asked a paleontologist, where should we build Calgary, they had said, east or west, you'll find dinosaurs. But nobody ever listens to paleontologists. So <laughs> we're stuck with what we have now. So now, if we use a little bit of information about uh, the biology of dinosaurs, we can refine our search for dinosaur fossils. So we know that dinosaurs were terrestrial animals. So this means that they're land-dwelling animals. They did not swim in the seas. They stayed on land. So from all the rocks left, if we eliminate all the rocks that formed underwater in the sea, we can see that all the rocks that have the right criteria, their Cretaceous age or formed during the age of the dinosaurs and formed on land, we can see that they're restricted to three broad belts in the southern half of the province from slightly north of Grand Prairie all the way to the American border. And then if we plot all the known fossil localities in the province, we can see that they all fall within these belts. And you can see that the number of localities uh, increases as you go farther south. That's because the climate becomes drier, more arid, less vegetation, more outcrops, therefore more dinosaur discoveries. So you can see, yeah, I said that all the, uh, the dinosaur localities fall within these belts, but you've probably noticed that big outlier right there. That's the case of the Fort McMurray dinosaur. It's a case of a dinosaur carcass that floated offshore and sank to the bottom of the sea and got fossilized there. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, the sun core and chylosaur uh, at the end of the talk. So numerous dinosaur discoveries have been made in Alberta over the years. Of course, professional paleontologists make a lot of discoveries. After all, we're getting paid to go look out for fossils. But uh, the truth is that many significant finds have been made by people without a paleontological background. For example, the First Nations and early explorers of the 20th century have made lots of great finds. And nowadays, lots of significant discoveries are made by members of the public in the context of recreational activities or by the industry in the context of their daily routine activities. So for the rest of the talk, I'll showcase some of the great discoveries that have been made in Alberta by all these people over the last 150 years. First Nations have inhabited Alberta for nearly 10,000 years, so it's not really surprising that they knew of the existence of fossils. For example, First Nations have used buffalo stones and amylite in many of their sacred rituals. And it turns out that those uh, sacred artifacts are the remains, uh, the fossilized remains of the shells of squid-like animals that lived in the oceans during the age of the dinosaurs. So the First Nations did not know that their sacred artifacts were actually the fossilized remains of long dead animals. But nevertheless, they had found their fossilized remains long before the first Europeans arrived in Western Canada. But the question is, did the First Nations know of the existence of dinosaur bones? And the resounding answer is yes. We have written proof that the First Nations knew of the existence of dinosaur bones in a letter written by a priest in 1871. The priest was working with the Pagan Nation, close to today's Dinosaur Provincial Park, and uh, in a letter that he wrote in 1871 to the Governor General of Canada, in which he described his interactions with the First Nations, there's one passage, one uh, series of, uh, of sentences in his letter that are really reve revealing. So if you can read his cursive, and you can read French, you'll be able to tra check my translation. But the priest mentions that as he went down in the coulees close to today's Dinosaur Provincial Park, among the debris of erratic blocks, many fossilized bones of back vertebrae of a powerful animal, maybe from the Silurian epoch, can be found. These enormous vertebrae measure up to 20 inches in circumference. The natives say that the grandfather of the buffalo is buried here. They worship these remains with offerings in order to gain the support for their hunt of the spirit that once inhabited them. 
So the bones that the priest is referring to are probably bones that looked a little bit like this. They're disc-shaped bones called a, a centrum. And when complete, they are part, they are the lower part of a vertebra or a backbone of a large animal. And the priest knew that they belonged to an animal. He mentions that they're from possibly a Silurian epoch. It's because they're so big that he knew they couldn't belong to any living animal that he saw on the prairies at that time. So given that the priest was in, uh, close to Dinosaur Provincial Park, the bones that he found probably belonged to a large duckbill dinosaur or maybe a horned dinosaur. So the letter in 1871 by the priest is the first documented dinosaur discovery in Canadian history, but that's documented by Europeans. In this letter, it clearly states that the natives knew of the, of the existence of those bones. They didn't know to what they belonged. They knew that they couldn't belong to a living animal today because they were far too big. So that's why they described the bones to one of their natural spirits, namely the grandfather of the buffalo. So that letter by the priest in 1871 truly confirms that the First Nations had discovered dinosaur bones long before Europeans arrived in Western Canada. Then following the letter from uh, the priest, a lot of explorers started coming to Western Canada in what was part at the time of the Northwest Territories. Some of the early explorers were coming to map the Canada-US border. Others were coming to look for natural resources. So one of those early explorers was Joseph Tyrrell, a geologist who was working for the Geological Survey of Canada. And Tyrrell had been sent to the Northwest Territories to look for a new uh, source of energy, namely coal. And in 1884, Tyrrell wrote in his notes that as he came down in the valley close to modern-day Drumheller, he climbed up a hill to go inspect uh, a coal seam. And as he climbed up, he made a discovery. There was this skull leering at me, sticking right out of the ground. And this is what Tyrrell discovered. He, he found the lower jaws and the partial skull of a large meat-eating dinosaur. Now, Tyrrell was a geologist, not a paleontologist, but he recognized the significance of his find. So he collected it as best as he could, packed it as best as he could, brought it up to prayer level, put it in a wagon, shipped it to the closest uh, train station, which at the time, I think, was in Medicine Hat. And then the specimen made the long way all the way back east to Ottawa, where in a typical federal government fashion, the specimen was put on the shelf for 20 years. And then uh, in 1905, an American paleontologist who was describing a new species that he was going to name Tyrannosaurus rex looked at Tyrrell's specimen and recognized that it was something distinct and something closely related to T. rex. So he decided to call the animal Albertosaurus because Alberta had just become a province in 1905. And Albertosaurus means lizard from Alberta. So since Terrell's discovery, numerous skeletons and skulls of Albertosaurus have been discovered. And now we know that really, yeah, Albertosaurus is very T-Rex-like, very similar to T-Rex, just slightly smaller, more likely built, and lived a few million years prior to uh, T-Rex. But despite the fact that Terrell's discovery is incomplete, it's still very significant to this day, because Terrell's discovery was the first time that a meat-eating dinosaur was discovered in Canada. But it was also the first time that a Tyrannosaur, a member of the T-Rex family, was discovered anywhere in the world. So Tyrrell's discovery is still very significant to this day. So following Tyrrell's discovery, a lot of scientists and explorers came to Alberta. This time, they meant business. They were coming specifically to look for dinosaur bones. And that trend culminated in a time period called uh, the Great Canadian Dinosaur Rush a time that saw at least two teams compete with one another to the, discover the most skeletons and ship them back to their home institutions out east. So on the one side, we had uh, Barnum Brown leading a team from the American Museum of Natural History uh, in New York City. And on the other side, we have the Sternberg family, four Americans hired by the Geological Survey of Canada to compete with Brown in order to keep the specimens in Canada. In those days, there were very few vertebrate paleontologists in Canada, so the GSC had to actually hire Americans to come compete with another American team in order to keep the specimens in Canada. So during the following 10 to 15 years, these teams would go at it, try to outdo, outcompete the others, and find the most uh, beautiful specimens. And conditions at the time were really rudimentary. There were no easy access roads to any of the badlands, so the best way 
was to actually float down the Red Deer River on a scow. And then when you'd encounter outcrops that were interesting, you'd come ashore, establish your base camp, and then go prospecting or looking for fossils. And you can see in those days that mosquitoes seem to have been really bad, so it's good to see that some things do never change. And then when they would, uh, the scientists would discover uh, new skeletons, they would pull out the picks and the shovels and start digging. There were no jackhammers or heavy equipment in those days, so everything had to be done by hand. And that meant oftentimes that a lot of rock had to be removed and uh, all that overburden pushed away, especially in cases where complete dinosaur skeletons were discovered. And then you were still left with the problem of bringing the specimen back home. Fossils are never conveniently located right next to the river where you can float it down or near prairie level where you can just put them on a cart and take them away. So oftentimes they're lost in the middle of the badlands. So you had to find a way to bring your wagon as close as possible to the fossil locality. And then once the specimen has been uh, broken up in blocks and jacketed, you load the blocks onto your wagon, and then you still are faced with the long journey home. You have to find a way to come back to prairie level to bring your specimens to the nearest train station so they can ship back east to your home institution. So for those of you who have been to Dinosaur Provincial Park before, this landscape probably looks familiar because the slope on which the wagon is currently uh, climbing is actually the same slope on which the paved road has been built to get down to the visitor center. The visitor center is built at the base of that hill right there. So despite the rudimentary conditions at the time, this proved to be a golden age for dinosaur discoveries in Canada. By the end of the Great Canadian Dinosaur Rush, over 300 significant specimens had been collected from Dinosaur Park alone, and all these specimens were shipped to museums uh, around the world. There's very few that actually stayed here in Alberta. Here's a slide that gives you a little overview of all the species that were discovered during the Great Canadian Dinosaur Rush, uh, at least species for which significant specimens uh, were found. So it gives you an idea of yeah, the sheer amount of uh, discoveries that were made uh, during uh, that time period, a rate of discovery that hasn't been replicated since, although now we're beginning to uh, enter a new uh, dinosaur age. That brings us to uh, modern day paleontologists. Most people, when you tell them about professional paleontologists, they think of about the Royal Tyrrell Museum. Since the early 80s, the Tyrrell Museum has been the leading force, if not the main force, uh, the sole force in terms of paleontological research in Western Canada. But things are starting to change in the last few years. Many museums and universities have hired vertebrate paleontologists such that nowadays there's at least six different institutions conducting field work in Alberta every summer. So this means that with more eyes in the field, we can probably expect to find, uh, have more and more discoveries uh, made over the years to come. So I could talk for hours about significant finds uh, about, uh, made by professional paleontologists, but that'd probably put you all to sleep. So instead, I will just focus on one discovery that made the headlines recently and one in which I actually played a, a role. So enter specimen TMP 1995-1101. It's a nearly complete skeleton of an ostrich mimic dinosaur called Ornithomimus. The specimen was discovered in 1995 by a Tyrrell team working in Dinosaur Park. They weren't looking for dinosaurs, they were actually digging for plant fossils and accidentally discovered the dinosaur skeleton. So this specimen turned out uh, to be really significant because not only it's one of the most complete dinosaur skeletons ever discovered, but it also preserves two very special features that were previously unknown in ostrich mimic dinosaurs. So during preparation of the beautiful skull, paleontologists had noticed a very strange feature at the tip of the snout of the animal. So upon closer inspection, they noticed that it was that colored staining resting right on top of uh, the, the snout of the animal. And these colored features turned out to be the fossilized remains of the keratinous beak of the ornithomimid. Because ornithomimids lack teeth, paleontologists had long thought that uh, these animals had a beak just like birds, but because the, the beaks of birds is made of keratin, the same material that forms your fingernails, and not made of bone, these features had never been fossilized before until that specimen uh, was discovered. 
So in 2001, the discovery was published in the prestigious journal Nature, and our TMP specimen became the first to preserve, preserve evidence of a keratinous beak in ostrich mimic dinosaurs. But that wasn't going to be the last surprise the specimen had for us. During preparation, paleontologists and technicians had noticed those strange markings on the, bo the bones of the forearm of the animals. You can see here those markings, they look like someone with, with a Sharpie and drew on the bones, but those are actually true, legitimate, fossilized imprints. But the question is for imprints of what? So it took nearly 20 years before new specimens were discovered in the Dromella region by local resident Frank Hadfield, discovered two specimens of ornithomimids. In the field, they didn't look like they preserved anything special, but during uh, excavation and su subsequent expert preparation by Donna McLeod, we discovered that these animals actually were covered with feathers. So all those black strings here, those are the imprints left by the filamentous or um, down-like feathers that covered the bodies of these animals. So now we knew that these animals were actually covered with feathers. It was the first time that a feathered dinosaur was discovered in North America but it was also the first time that a feathered ornithomimid was discovered anywhere in the world. So that was a great discovery, and it forced us to revisit the markings on the, on the forearms of the animal. Now that we knew these animals had feathers, we started comparing the markings on the forearms to birds, and we realized that the arrangement and the orientation of the markings on the forearms matched perfectly the arrangement of the feathers that cover the wings of modern birds. So now we had evidence that these animals actually not only were covered with feathers, but they also had wings. So alongside collaborators, uh, Darla Zelinitsky from the UFC and many other collaborators, we published this discovery in science. And again, our TMP specimens turned out to be the first to preserve, preserve evidence of, feather, uh, of feathers in ornithomimids, but also the first time we had wings in these animals. And what was really interesting is that we saw that the adults had wings, but the juveniles or the babies did not have them. So that told us that wings probably first evolved for courtship and display, and only later during evolution, as we got closer and closer to the, the ancestral birds, were wings actually co-opted for another function, eventually for flight. So we have two great uh, discoveries in one specimen. Disco first discovery of beaks, first discoveries of feathers and wings, in, an animal, in a specimen that was discovered by accident by people looking for fossil plants. That's not bad for government work, if you ask me. And I want to take this opportunity to thank Dennis Brayman for discovering the beautiful specimen. I'm sure it's his favorite specimen. <laughs> now we move on to uh, discoveries made by the public. Uh, numerous discoveries have been made by uh, paleontologists, but nowadays, People uh, have an eye open, they keep an eye open. They know what to look for in the context of their recreational activities, whether they go hiking, fishing, camping. Uh, they often go to remote areas where professional paleontologists don't even think of going. So as such, the members of the public are our eyes in the field, and we're really grateful when they report uh, new discoveries. So I decided to showcase three different examples that exemplifies yeah, some of the great discoveries that have been made by uh, members of the public. The first one happened in the early 80s when three little boys in the Pincher Creek area uh, decided to go fishing uh, after a hard day at school. And as they went down to the river, they went, walked past an outcrop and noticed black bones that were sticking out of the ground. So they reported their find. A crew from the Trail Museum went to investigate the site, ended up uh, doing a large excavation, and lo and behold, the bones that the young boys had discovered were part of a skeleton of a T-Rex. And uh, so the, because the bone was black, the specimen was given the name Black Beauty. Now, the skeleton of Black Beauty is only 30% complete, so this means only 30% of the bones of the skeleton were recovered, but the most important part of the skeleton, namely the skull, was present and was collected. And now both the skull and the skeleton can be seen on display here at the Royal Tyrrell Museum. Second discovery was made this time in the late 80s by a teenage, uh, teenage girl uh, called Wendy Soboda in the hills south of Lethbridge. She was specifically looking for dinosaur bones. 
And then one of these days, she found tiny, tiny little shards that were really weird looking. They were only one centimeter across or smaller. So she collected them, reported them, and turns out that she had discovered the first dinosaur eggshell in Canada, in, in Alberta. So a crew from the Toronto Museum went to investigate the site, relocated the site where she had found the eggshells, and that led them to discover numerous dinosaur nests. At first, they discovered the nest of a large duck-billed dinosaur called Hypacrosaurus, but later on, they found a nest of small meat-eating dinosaurs as well, called Troodon. But as if that wasn't enough, paleontologists also discovered tiny, almost microscopic bones eroding out of the hill. Sometimes they were found within the confine of entire eggs. So that told them that they had found the fossilized remains of unhatched dinosaur embryos. So there were actually dinosaur babies preserved inside many of those nests. And to this day, there's three or four nests preserving embryos that have been collected. The site soon after became a provincial protected site called Devil's Coulee. Devil's Coulee is located roughly 40 minutes south of Lethbridge, and it's open to the public. Public can go on guided tours and visit the sites where the nests and the embryos were discovered. And later this spring, uh, we will be installing in the new interpretive signs that will better explain the significance and the history of the find. So if ever you're looking for a new uh, pilgrimage site this summer, Devil's Coulee is definitely a place I recommend to, to go and visit. And the last uh, public discovery I'll talk about is really special because it is directly related to the 2013 Alberta flood. So in the summer of 2013, Mr. Noel Plourd and his wife Sherry were going fishing close to their house in uh, Fort McLeod when they discovered large gray blocks that had been ripped out of the bank by the flood. And they saw there were also strange black features that were poking out of those blocks. So they gathered all the loose pieces and reported them to the Royal Toronto Museum. And then we went and investigated the site and looked at the blocks. And we immediately recognized that uh, Mr. and Mrs. Plort had discovered uh, uh, the skeleton of a small dog-sized dinosaur called Leptoceratops. And you can see here on the block, you can see the black features are bones. And we can easily recognize bones of the hind leg and bones of the forelimb there. And the fact that the bones are still connected together, still articulated as they were in life, tells us that there was great potential for the entire animal to be there. So in the summer of 2014, we went back to the site to try to collect whatever could have been left behind. And we can see here, this is a site where uh, the blocks were ripped out. And it's only two meters above river level. And the river level was extremely low when we visited. So there's no doubt that these blocks were ripped out by the 2013 flood. So a Tyrrell crew started uh, excavating the skeleton that was still left in the rock. They stayed high and dry, whereas members of the flood mitigation task force waded through the water looking for, uh, for fossils that may have been blocked. That's what they'd done all summer long, looking for the potential impact of the 2013 flood on paleontological sites. So while the Tyrrell crew stayed high and dry, we had some other people wading through the water, looking for blocks that could have, been, uh, could have fallen. And then we collected all the pieces, brought them back to the museum, and realized that we had nearly the entire skeleton was present as represented in red. We were missing the tail and the feet, which is unfortunate, but not a big deal. But we're also missing the top of the skull, the forehead. So that's really unfortunate. We'd like to retrieve uh, these pieces. So what we will do is summer of 2015, we'll go back in the river and scour some more, look for missing pieces. And this time, we may have to use high-tech equipment to survey the bottom of the river. <laughs> so Ben, this is a job for you. <laughs> Finally, I'll conclude by uh, talking about discoveries that have been made by the industry, uh, whether it's uh, during highways or buildings, uh, construction, during mining, or uh, during activities related to the oil and gas industry. Many of those activities result in ground disturbance. So there's always potential to uncover fossils that were not known to be present. And uh, I will, there's numerous discoveries that have been made by the industry, but I'll just focus my talk on three examples that have made the, the headlines in the past few years. The first one is a case of the corite marine reptiles south of Lethbridge. Second one is a case of the tourmaline hadrosaur 
near Spirit River. And finally, I'll talk briefly about the Suncor and Kyosaur discovered in Fort McMurray. So Karite International is a company that operates south of Lethbridge. They're mining the marine clays of their bear paw formation, and they're looking for amylite, so the beautiful semi-precious stone in order to either donate beautiful specimens like that to museums or the lower quality specimens turn them into beautiful jewelry. But while mining for the amylite, they often stumble upon those pesky little uh, vertebrate bones that are interspersed with the, the amylite. So when they do, Karite has developed a really good rapport with the Terrell Museum. They're really good at reporting their discoveries right away. And then we dispatch a crew to go and retrieve uh, the specimens. And Karite is really good, uh, is really willing to support us and help us put their heavy equipment at our disposal to carve a little pad so that our, uh, spec uh, our technicians can collect the specimens and they move their activities to elsewhere in the quarry while the technicians are collecting the specimens. And then when elder jacketing is done, Karite brings back their heavy equipment, lift the heavy blocks, and put them on the back of trailer tra uh, flatbed uh, trailer so they can be shipped back to the museum. And over the course of the years, many sick, beautiful, fully articulated animals have been discovered. They've found uh, many beautiful skeletons of mosasaurs. Those are marine reptiles closely related to snakes and Komodo dragons. And so far, we have evidence for at least two different species of mosasaurs from uh, the Korite mine. But we also find beautiful skeletons of elasmosaurs, the long-necked marine reptiles. And here, the, sp uh, the specimen up here is called Alberonectes. It's the animal with the longest neck to have ever existed, was discovered at the Korite mine. And that specimen was on display in the last sea dragon exhibit here at the museum until very recently. So I think in the time span of like three or four years, Korite contacted us. It's between yeah, half a dozen times and 10 times to go and retrieve some of the specimens. So we're really, really grateful for all the, the hard work they do for us and for reporting their finds. And we move on to the case of the tourmaline hadrosaur. In September of 2013, tourmaline oil was clearing a right of way for a pipeline in northwestern Alberta when a back operator noticed a big block that had a weird impression in it. So they sent us the photo, and we immediately recognized that they had discovered a fully articulated tail of a duck-billed dinosaur. And if you look in the background here, you can see other blocks that were moved. Those are the bones of the hip region, and the block containing supposedly the front half of the animal, keeps going into the hill. So we're really interested at trying to see what the, the front half of the animal looked like, because many hadrosaurs, when they die, they lose their heads. So the, the, the muscles and the ligaments holding the heads attached to the bodies are very weak. And it happens oftentimes that yeah, they rot away and the heads washed away. So we have many cases where we find hadrosaur skeletons without a head, or a hadrosaur head without a body. So in this case, we didn't know what was uh, going on, but we were, were really willing to, uh, to go and dig for it and see what was there. So uh, Tourmaline was extremely supportive of our efforts, and they put at our disposal all of their equipment. So uh, we went with a crew, and with help from the Grand Prairie Museum staff, we consolidated some of uh, the blocks that had been ripped out by the excavator and collected some of the loose pieces. And then when that was done, Tourmaline put uh, their best backhoe operator at our disposal and started lifting the blocks out of the quarry and put them on the back of the flat deck trailer so they could be shipped to the museum. And then they proceeded with taking down the hill so we could actually pursue the rock and try to reach uh, the front half of the animal. And then after a full day of work, the, the cliff had been pushed back by several tens of feet. And then the block that contained the front half of the animal was fully isolated. And at that point, our crew was uh, capable of moving in and trying to collect the piece. But you can see that the piece turned out to be extremely large, 3.5 meters long, 2.5 meters wide, estimated weight of several tens of thousands of pounds. So way too big to be lifted uh, as a whole unit and put on the back of a flat deck trailer. So it was decided at the time that we would uh, take advantage of natural fractures within the block and try to break it into smaller pieces 
so that they could be of manageable size and we can consolidate them, put them on the back of a trailer and bring them here. So over the following four or five days, that's what the crew did, trying to break away pieces of the larger block, consolidate it as best as they could, and then move them out and move on and try to make the bigger block small into smaller pieces. And then at the end of the fourth or fifth day, that's when they had the lucky breakthrough. On one of the blocks that they split open, they noticed a feature that was exposed. Now, if you look at Darren's face there, it's not a sad face. It's a very, very happy face. Now, why is Darren so happy? Well, exposed on the face of that block, the, the technicians immediately recognized what turned out to be the teeth, upper jaw, and the cheekbones of a duck-billed dinosaur. So now we had confirmation that there was indeed a head attached to the body of that animal. And that was a great, 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 great discovery. So all these blocks were now shipped back to the museum. But the problem is that the blocks were still very large, and so large that it would probably have taken close to 100 years for a technician to prepare all the blocks by hand. So that's when Can West Concrete Cutting came to the rescue. rescue. They were really generous with their expertise and their time, and they brought in some specialized equipment, such as a rope saw here that actually it's like a steel cable being rubbed against a block to trim it down into a smaller piece so that technicians could actually start and go directly down and work on the, on the skull of the, the specimen. Now we're still working on the, the preparation of these specimens. We're getting closer to the skull, so we don't really know what it looks like. But one thing's for sure, well, almost certain, is that it will belong to one of the two big subgroups of duckbill dinosaurs, either the hollow-crested hadrosaurs or the solid-crested hadrosaurs. Personally, I'm rooting for this one because they're much cooler looking, but it doesn't really matter because the rocks where uh, the tourmaline and hadrosaur were discovered are really ancient. They're among the oldest we know uh, uh, in terms of equivalency to southern Alberta. They're as old as some of the oldest rocks we have here. So regardless of whether the uh, uh, tourmaline hadrosaur is a hollow crested or a solid crested dinosaur, it will probably turn out to be one of the oldest duckbill dinosaur known in North America. So it's going to be a really significant find. Finally, I will conclude by talking about some of the uh, discoveries that were made in the Fort McMurray area during the exploitation of the, the oil sands. The big companies, Suncor and Syncrude, have made numerous great discoveries that they've uh, reported. And you can see here the quality of preservation is amazing, fully articulated skeletons. But until 2011, all of the skeletons they had discovered were of marine reptiles, not dinosaurs. So we have examples of the long-necked plesiosaurs, as well as some of the dolphin-shaped uh, ichthyosaurs. But there were no dinosaurs, unfortunately, until one fateful day in March of 2011 at the Suncor Millennium Mine, when uh, I was going to call that a backhoe, but it's more like an excavator because that's the size of a large building when they were uh, removing overburden on top of the, uh, the, tar uh, the oil sands, the, the operator noticed blocks that had a funky color and texture to them. So they were puzzled by their discovery, so they reported it to the Royal Terrell Museum. The crew was dispatched to investigate, and even they were puzzled by the discovery. It didn't make sense in terms of marine reptiles, because the rocks up there are marine, and so far, everything that had been discovered were marine reptiles. So uh, it didn't make sense. But then thinking outside the box, they suddenly realized that they were f looking at ribs, ossified tendons, and rows of bony armor that covered the body of the animal. So they realized that they weren't dealing with a marine reptile, but actually had discovered the rib cage of an armored dinosaur, the first dinosaur ever discovered in uh, Fort McMurray. And the rocks in Fort McMurray are much older than what we have down, uh, down south. Up there, the rocks are roughly 115 million years old, whereas down here, it's 80 million years old or younger. So, so it turned out to be a really significant discovery. Unfortunately, the excavator operator had hit the back half of the animal during the excavation. But there was still potential for the front half of the animal, and maybe even the head, to still be present in, in the rock. So now it became a race at 
who would discover where the specimen came from. So in the large mine, they had to go back to where the excavator had noticed uh, the blocks. And of course, as Murphy's Law would have it, the front half of the animal would be dead center in the middle of a 50 meter tall cliff. So how do you get to the front half of the animal? Well, Suncor was extremely supportive and put at, our, uh, at the museum's disposal all of the AV equipment. They didn't let us drive them, but still, they actually used them to remove all of the overburden. And then they started yeah, taking down the cliff down to the level of the specimen and carve all the way around it so the block could be isolated. And then uh, once the specimen was jacketed, they brought in a huge crane to lift the block, put it on the back of a flat deck trailer, and ship it back to the museum. There at the museum, technician, uh, technician was devoted basically almost every waking hours of his, well, maybe not every waking hours, but most of his days at working exclusively on this specimen. And it turned out to be really tedious work because the rock was so hard and the bone was so soft. You had to be really careful not to damage a specimen during preparation. So expert preparation by Mark Mitchell here. And then nearly four years later, what we have is now the front half of a beautiful 3D animal, essentially a mummified dinosaur. You can see here all the armor, uh, the bony armor covering the back of the animal, big spikes sticking out of the neck region, and we have a beautifully preserved 3D skull along with that. And if that's not enough, all the black coloring here covering the bones is actually the fossilized skin of the animal that's preserved. So that's a really significant specimen. And uh, there's still another two and a half to three years of preparation left before the full specimen is, uh, is prepared. But already, we know that it's going to be uh, the most complete and the most best preserved ankylosaur, and uh, probably uh, one of the most ancient ankylosaur in North America. So it will be a, a, yeah, it's a very significant uh, discovery. So in conclusion, uh, if you weren't convinced before my talk, I hope now I convinced you that Alberta truly is the land of dinosaurs. There's nowhere else on Earth, where uh, there's very few places on Earth where you find as many good specimens. And that's because we have the perfect combination of the geologic history and the modern climate. We could have the perfect climate, really arid, lots of exposures, but if the bedrock were, had not been deposited during the age of the dinosaurs, we'd find fossils of other animals. We may find saber tooths and uh, horn uh, rhino-like mammals, they're cool, but they're not dinosaur cool. So, so that's uh, one of the reasons. And also, we could have the opposite. We could have the right rocks that preserve dinosaur bones. But if the climate was much more humid, we'd have forests everywhere. And that's the case with the eastern seaboard of the United States. From New Jersey all the way down to Alabama, you have rocks that formed during the age of the dinosaurs. And they have fossils. But there's forests everywhere. Everything is covered. So it's really difficult to find fossils down there. So here we have the, perfect, uh, the best of both worlds, basically. And then I think the take home message of my presentation is that significant discoveries are not only made by professional paleontologists. The next big find could be yours, whether you're uh, at work or whether you're doing recreational activities or if you're digging in your sandbox in your backyard you could actually come across the next big significant discovery. And what's important is that you should know is that significant discoveries rarely look significant. They always look really, really bad. And here's an example of basically exploded bones that yeah, are in pitiful, pitiful shape. But this turned out to be the first feathered dinosaur ever discovered in North America. And then this badly broken bone, too, you say, oh, man, it's too bad. We should have been here 50 years ago. But once collected and pieced back together, it turned out to be a nearly complete jaw, lower jaw of a T-Rex. And we only have a handful of those in the province. So a significant find rarely looks significant. So that's why it's important that uh, those specimens be reported. So what should you do if you find fossils? Well, first and foremost, do not collect them. Not only is it illegal to dig a specimen out of the ground, but there's a great risk of damaging the specimens, and we lose a lot of scientific information by digging the specimens out of the ground. If the specimens are left in the ground, we can determine how old the specimens are, uh, what's the possible cause of death of the animal, and what's the potential of finding more bones in the area, and is it, is, is it even worth digging into the hill to see if there's more bones. So whatever you do, do not collect them. Instead, take photos good and focused photos with a time scale would be good. And then if you have GPS coordinates, 
Uh, you should probably yeah, record those. Or if you don't have any information, note down any location information. Because it's amazing what paleontologists can do when we know where the specimen is. If we can put a dot on the map saying, OK, this specimen is from here, we can say how old that specimen is, what could it potentially be, and uh, is it significant? Do we have a million bones from that area, or is it actually a unique find? And then really important is actually report those fossils. We can go through the website, send an email, and send a, attach the photos and the GPS coordinates. And then someone will get back and contact you to uh, discuss uh, your find and give you an update on what uh, is going on. And finally, did I mention do not collect the fossils? <laughs> And then, so, so if after discussion with the paleontologist, it's determined that the specimen is worth collecting, then you may be actually in, be invited to be part of the next generation of paleontologists that will actually go and collect a specimen. So uh, finally, I'd like to thank a lot of people. I'd like first and foremost to thank the industry, all the big companies that do uh, their um, uh, good diligence and report all of their finds. We greatly appreciate it. Let's have, but there's rumors out there that some people are afraid to report their fines because uh, some companies are afraid to report their fines because they think we'll shut them down and they'll never get to work there. But that's not our goal. Our goal is to get the specimen out of their ASAP so the companies can actually go back and do their business as usual. So that's why we really appreciate yeah, the, all the, uh, the effort and the collaboration of all the, the big companies that, in reporting your fossils. But I'd also like to thank members of the public that have made so many uh, different, uh, significant, significant finds and reported them to us. A big thank you to all of those. And I think the, the unsung heroes in here also, all the landowners, even though legally they don't own the fossils, we still need to ask their permission in order to go retrieve the fossils or even to go looking for fossils. So we greatly appreciate uh, the help of uh, all the landowners that allow us to go looking for fossils. And finally, I'd like to thank yeah, a bunch of colleagues who contributed to this talk in various ways. And thank you all for coming here today. Excuse me. So we have time for questions. Ah, I scooped you there. <laughs> well, I think there's a strong case for Albertosaurus. It's significant for so many ways. The first carnivorous dinosaur discovered in, uh, in Alberta the first tyrannosaur discovered anywhere in the world. And yeah, because it has, and it's well known from several specimens also, and it's kind of iconic as well. And the fact that it's named after the province doesn't help, uh, doesn't hurt either. But I'd say that probably uh, Albertosaurus uh, would probably be the, basically the flagship. But yeah, if you wanted to go with something that's more representative in terms of abundance, probably Centrosaurus would be uh, the best bet. But I think if you want something iconic, something ferocious, You'd go with Albertosaurus. <laughs> well, th there's a technique called ground penetrating radar that basically uh, sends sound, oh, basically shock waves through the ground and reflects back at you what uh, the details of what's underneath. But it's working with changes in the in lithologies or densities. So with the fossils being the same uh, density as the rock. Uh, what you saw in Jurassic Park, well, that's where they use a ground penetrating radar and they see on their screen the beautiful fully articulated skeleton. That's probably not very likely to happen. But uh, I gave a talk at CSPG last fall and I talked to a, a geologist, a Texas State geologist, and he said now they have micro seismic that's actually going in extremely high resolution. And he said that there's no reason why that, the, that technique wouldn't work, because uh, he said, yeah, ground penetrating radar, it's too coarse, you're probably not going to pick up the bones. But micro seismic techniques are actually really revolutionary, and lots of companies are using it nowadays to look for uh, uh, reservoir properties, porosity, and whatnot. And suppose he said that there's no reason why that technique wouldn't work. So, so it could be a possibility, but I'm not sure yet yeah, what scale you'd have to be. If your specimen is immediately underneath, maybe it works. But as a prospecting tool, like you plant your tools here and you hope to find somewhere in the area, yeah, I'm not overly confident that yeah, those techniques work. The, uh, to this day, yeah, this, the best method is still just people going out in the field and keeping their eyes on the ground and looking for, uh, for bones that are uh, eroding out of the ground. That's, uh, that's the best way that, that works. <laughs> That's a very good question. Yeah, it all depends yeah, on where you go. Wherever you go, you need to have landowner permission. So you can't just go look at random for fossils. You always need to ask for land permi uh, permission from the landowner. 
And there's exceptions like parks. That's a no-go. Yeah, you can't collect, for example, the badlands around the museum. That's all part of Midland Provincial Park. So all parks are protected. So you cannot even surface collect fossils. But uh, the only occasion you can is if you have landowner and if the fossils are at the surface. You don't need to dig for them. There's no resistance. For example, you find a loose tooth at the surface or bone shards. If you have landowner permission, and uh, as a rule of thumb, if there's no resistance when you put it up, uh, pick it up from the ground, then it's okay for you to bring it. You do not own the fossil. You become the custodian of the fossil. Because by law, all fossils belong to all Albertans. So they do not become your property. You become custodian. So you can bring it home, and then uh, you can build your own little collection. But you're not allowed to sell the fossil. So don't try selling it on eBay. You can't uh, modify it in any way, so you can't drill a hole through it and turn it into a necklace. And you can't take it out of the province either. So as long as yeah, you have the landowner permission, the specimens are surface collected, then it's OK for you to bring it home. But it does not become your property. You're still the, just a custodian of that, uh, of that specimen. Even if you bring it home, who knows? Maybe it will turn out like years down the road. You decide to, OK, well, I'm going to show a specimen to to paleontologists, bring them to the museum and realize, oh, you know, that's a significant find. Actually, uh, would you be interested in donating it to the museum? And then, yeah, if you say, oh, I collected it 30 years ago, I have no idea where it came from, well, then it's of actually limited use. It's a neat specimen, but since we have no idea where it came from, uh, we can't do much with it except to have it yeah, in, the, in our collections. But, so that's why, yeah, if, even if you collect specimens, it's nice for, it would be nice if you actually wrote down information and keep it with a specimen so that Years later, you say, well, I can't remember where I found that piece, but let's look at this piece of uh, paper. Oh, look, I discovered it in Horse Thief Canyon or somewhere. So we have some information as to where uh, these specimens uh, come from. Well, we have some rapport with some museums around the world, but in terms of helping them maintain their own collections, I don't think they, we contribute anything. The, law, uh, the case of Mongolia is unfortunate because it's it's definitely uh, one of the best places in the world uh, where you can find fossils, but it's such a poor country that usually uh, the techniques and the curation techniques have lagged behind with basically the, the Western Hemisphere. So, so it's unfortunate, but uh, I think they're making uh, leap and bounds improvements nowadays that there's recognition of some uh, of the significance of those finds. And I think it's last year or two years ago, there's a specimen that was on sale in the States and was seized and returned back to uh, Mongolia, where now they're building a new museum with all those beautiful specimens that have been seized. So I think, yeah, there's going to be a, an improvement now that there's recognition at the high official levels of the significance of dinosaur fossils. So there's definitely going to be a, a lot of improvement in the years to come. And then, yeah, we have some collaborators from museums in China, everywhere, when they they want to open a museum. The, the Terrell has kind of become the flagship, the standard by which museums want to operate. So they often come. We have delegations come visit the museum, see how we maintain our collections, what's our standards, and they try to accomplish the same. So we, so we don't directly like send them money to maintain their collections, but we do help in the, the best we can uh, to give them an example and give them some, some advice in terms of what technique can be used to, to properly manage their collections.